Welcome. It's great to see your faces coming in into the Zoom room. And I know we've been saying now for 18 months, it won't be too long until we're in an actual room together, but I, I think it's actually uh, uh, getting to that point. So um, great to see you. I'm Beth Brown. I'm the CEO of Community Foundation Sonoma County, and my colleagues and I are delighted to welcome you to this forum today on a really critical topic on youth mental health. Um, many of you are very old friends of the foundation and have been affiliated with us in some ways for years and years. Many of you came to know us and began your partnership with us on what is now almost exactly four, four years ago in the 2017 fires. And at the time, in those moments and in the days, and as it turns out, months and years that followed, uh, what we knew one thing we would need as a community is healing community trauma. Um, that that crisis would have a long lasting effect for all of us that were in it. And since that time, of course, we've had escalating and continuing crisis with COVID year, uh, with fires year after year, and then COVID. And there's no group that has been more challenged um, than our students. And I know many of you have young people in your life, um, you know, people in your family, people that you care about who are students right now. And I think even thinking back to your own experience as being a teenager, like it's hard enough, it's so challenging and it has its own set of traumas just to be in that age group. But add to that some of the challenges that our young people face uh, related to their own family situations and online learning and racial injustices and the time that we're in. Uh, and we're so, uh, we, we wish we didn't have to be here today to share this data, but we're grateful for the data because it reveals what is already here around the challenges that our young people are facing. And once we know that, we can do something about it. Um, and I'm just delighted to introduce you to my colleague, Karen Demarest, who many of you know, who's been leading this effort. Um, and oh, I, ha I have my housekeeping orders that I think I forgot before I turn it over to Karen. And I think probably most of you are familiar by this point in Zoom land uh, that there is a chat function. We welcome your questions by chat uh, throughout. So we will be referring to those and grouping them at the end, but don't hesitate to go ahead and put them in the chat uh, as they occur to you. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Karen Demarest, Vice President for Community Impact. Thanks, Karen. Thanks so much, Beth. Hello, everybody. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna start by sharing my screen. Um, there you go. I'm just, I'm so grateful for all of you to take this time this afternoon and, and learn with us. Um, this is not easy. The data is not easy to see, but it is, as Beth said, vitally important that we learn directly from the students, families, and school staff about what they're strugg struggling with so that we can make decisions based on their need, what they're telling us. And that's what Youth Truth does. So I'm gonna kick us off today by talking about the origins of Youth Truth and um, the context in with which the survey has taken place. And then I'll pass it to the fabulous Jessica Progolski, who is going to take us through the data. So Youth Truth, um, we were honored. It was in 2017 um, when the Hewlett Foundation reached out to us and asked us to partner with them in Youth Truth, which was a Bay is a Bay Area initiative um, that was designed to learn um, how youth voice can influence philanthropic investment. And uh, as soon as we learned about the initiative, we eagerly uh, signed up. And, and realized really quickly that it would be great to bring in another local foundation, the Career Technical Edu Education Foundation. We are, we are all about partnership here. So we wanted them to partner with us um, on this because they do make investments in schools as well. And we knew that they could learn from this data. So 
we are just we are pleased and proud to see how this initiative has grown from just two schools in 2017 with a thousand responses to now over 38,000 responses um, in the last academic school year. Uh, there's going to be more data coming out. It continues to grow, and we're just so grateful to see how it has really become meaningful to the schools and uh, in our in our community. So. Um, as you know, a lot has happened in our community since 2017. And so the next few slides, we're going to show you how the initiative has evolved in response to the realities experienced by our community. So what started as a simple pilot back in 2017 with over a thousand high school students, um, you know, began to grow. But then in 2017, uh, you know, as Beth said, four years ago, right now, it's hard to imagine the tubs, nuns, and pockets fires hit, hit our community. So in year two of Youth Truth, uh, it was challenging to make the case that student surveys would be worth prioritizing when so many resources and time, on, and understandably so, were going to fire recovery. Um, but it, it didn't just happened that year, it actually expanded with five really brave high schools prioritizing, elevating student voice. And they even expanded at that point to include the family survey and the uh, staff surveys. So uh, the number of respondents was multiplied by five. Then in October of 2019, we experienced the Kincaid fires. And um, while we knew that there was a need for human-centered data to help inform the fire efforts, we just we we knew that the the survey needed to reflect that. So um, we started to think about questions um, related to the experiences and needs uh, related to the fire. And Youth Truth is they're they're just such professionals. They develop specific questions for uh, fire um, impacts. And I, I just I love the way they developed the the questions. They they did a review of community resilience literature. They studied studied disaster sociology, and then they designed specific questions that were accessible and relatable to uh, the survey respondents, which goes all the way from elementary to high school. So with the new resilient questions developed in year three, um, thirty seven schools across six districts participated. Um, resulting in feedback from over 16,000 community members. So it was growing, it was taking hold, then COVID. And in response to the move to emergency distance learning, Youth Truth, and Youth Truth is a, is a national organization, they developed um, field and field tested questions, um, nationally field tested the questions for uh, COVID-19 and distance learning. So we got to benefit from that as well. Then last summer and fall, of course, we experienced the devastating glass fire and the LNU lightning complex fire. So just year after year, as we all know, and the burden this has, uh, the, the burden and the toll it's taken on our students is, is really, really difficult. And you'll see that in the data. So in, in year four, the survey included the standard questions, um, standard survey questions, the custom resilience questions, and then the COVID distance learning questions. And we had 56 schools across 10 districts. Um, we gathered over 38,000 community voices. Uh, and that's the data you're gonna see today. It's powerful and you're only gonna get a slice of it. So if you are interested on our website, we have access to a lot more data than you're gonna to see today. You can dive in more deeply. It's all disaggregated. So you're not seen by district. That's their private information. They have access to it, but um, it's aggregated data. So you can uh, see it all together. Um, and at this point, I really just wanna pause because uh, and just express my gratitude to the teachers, to the school staff um, for, for their efforts to help make this stick. Um, it's, it is, as I said, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to take time out of a school year or a school day, even when so much is happening. And so we're just so grateful for everyone who has participated. Um, at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna hand it over to Jessica. Uh, Jessica Progolski, she is a 
powerhouse. She started as a classroom teacher, which she actually got to do again today because everybody who is involved in education is stepping in as substitute teachers right now. And that's what she did today, going back to her roots. Um, she is now though the college and career readiness lead at Sonoma County Office of Education, where she endeavors to ensure that students have relevant, meaningful learning experiences so that they're really engaged at school. Um, she's been just an incredible partner in this work, and I'm so grateful for her to be here today with us to share the Youth Truth data. So, Jessica, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Karen. What a warm welcome. I, I shared with the Community Foundation team uh, just prior to the start of this meeting that this will be the second best part of my day. As Karen shared, I um, had the opportunity to sort of emergency substitute teach in a local high school today. And um, I think that really is, is top of mind for me as I have the opportunity here in a few brief moments to elevate their voices for you all. As Karen shared, and um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more to this as I begin to share my own screen. Um, as Karen shared, you know, we, there's a lot of responsibility that comes ultimately with, with curating data. And um, there is so much more that we could and would love to share with you and that you, as Karen mentioned, through the Community Foundation website can dig into. But for today, we have um, really curated a list of, of data that is painful in some cases and hard to hear, um, but accurate and continually reinforced by those nearly 25,000 students we heard from in grades three through 12 last year. So let's, let's pause for just a minute and talk about what the actual Youth Truth instrument, the, the survey itself measures. Within the student survey, there are multiple domains, and here you're seeing in Sonoma County all of the things that we're measuring for. Definitely, um, if you have questions about more specifics um, related to what each one of these entails, that's something we could, would, could answer for you in um, the latter part of our time together when we have a question and answer time. But a couple of things that I do want to point out, certainly there are sort of the cognitive end of, of the spectrum. So things around engagement and academic challenge and instructional methods. But importantly, and in and, and my point of view, inextricably, we have some important culture and belonging and health and well-being measures. And I think it's when we look at these as a composite picture that we really get a better experience of, of what um, is going on for students in our community. I'll distinguish only because it's a question that regularly comes up, the domain of culture, or excuse me, the domain of relationships from the domain of belonging. Relationships have to do more with the students and their adult educators. So that's what that particular domain and that section of the survey measures. Whereas belonging has more to do with peer-to-peer -peer interactions and peer-to-peer -peer relationships. And we'll say more about each of these things um, over the next few minutes. So let's, let's dive into what we learned, again, from those nearly 25,000 students. First, I'd like to orient you a little bit to what the Youth Truth data looks like. If you haven't yet had a chance to see any of the Youth Truth data, um, it's important to, to know what you're looking at in terms of the percentile ranks. So on this particular slide, you're seeing all of the Sonoma County elementary students who responded to last year's survey. And you're seeing, in this case, the six domains, the six areas in which they participated in, in the survey. The percentile rank is out of 100, where you are sort of the highest performing um, entity within all of the Youth Truth organization. So Karen mentioned that this is a national organization. So by comparison with all California schools participating in the Youth Truth effort, and by comparison with all schools nationally. So if you're in the 100th percentile, you're really rocking it for students, right? You're doing really right by them, again, according to their own perceptions. And if you fall um, below the 50th percentile, you know, there's definitely room for growth. And so you can see immediately from our elementary students, um, they're telling us some things about where it's going well for them and, and where we could do better. I'll point out that this gray bar down at the bottom is uh, shows Sonoma County data with respect to California. So this percentile in, in, in orange represents us compared to all youth through schools. 
Whereas um, it also shows where we fall based on California schools with this hash mark here being the California median. Lots more I can say and, and the work that we do to support schools about how you can change the cohorts by which you compare yourself. Um, but I think for our time together today, it's helpful to have both the national in that orange and then the state comparative data. We heard from a bunch of middle schoolers as well, what life was like for them last year across five different domains in this case ranging from sort of the 20th percentile for academic challenge up through 60th percentile for relationships. So again, you see we have areas to grow across the board and some are more dire than others. And then finally, we heard from Sonoma County high schoolers. You'll notice there is a distinct high school domain in the area of college and career readiness where students across Sonoma County high school students are reporting less levels of agreement around their perceptions of their readiness for college and career than their California peers and then their peers nationally. So now that we've oriented you a little bit to what some of the, the snapshot data looks like, let's dig in a little bit further to some of the key findings. The first is what Karen sort of teed up for us. We had the opportunity to sort of disaggregate it and do some correlation based on students self-reporting how much the, the recent wildfires and the COVID-19 pandemic has affected them. And so what you see here is that of the respondents, remember right now we're really queuing in on student data, but the beauty of Youth Truth is that it talks to families and staff as well. And we're able to see if their stories sort of corroborate those of students or if they're distinct. In this case, across Sonoma County, we learned that uh, nearly one in four students have said that the wildfires are, are continuing to affect them. Over half of families and over half of staff are saying that the California wildfires locally have affected them. In terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing over half of students, almost three quarters of families and three quarters of staff saying that the COVID pandemic has significantly affected them. Let's pause for a minute on that. Do so you remember that timeline that Karen shared about multiple community tragedies here locally? And it's been a while that we've experienced fires, especially the first you know, really significant fire in our community back now almost four years ago. And four years later, still nearly one in four students, 25%, are still meaningfully feeling those effects, right? Still reporting that as, as recently as April of last year. So let's talk about some of the obstacles to learning that emerged through the COVID-19 pandemic. This slide, I'm not gonna belabor because uh, the, the Community Foundation team has helpfully created a, a graphically more appealing slide. Uh, but basically what you're about to see is some data related to students' responses of how they were affected by the COVID pandemic. So the question that students were asked was, do any of the following make it difficult or hard for you to do your best in school? And of the middle school students who responded, 65% of them had said, yes, there's at least one obstacle to me doing my best. And in high school, we saw 63% saying, yes, there's at least one obstacle that's in the way to doing my best. And there were multiple options that students had to choose from about the, the pervasive barriers for them. What surprised us and perhaps shouldn't have is that in Sonoma County very early on, feelings of depression, stress, and anxiety emerged as the number one barrier for middle and high school students. It was interesting because the Youth Truth, turned to Sonoma County, Youth Truth team turned to Sonoma County and said, what's going on there? In some ways, we were a little bit of a harbinger of what was to come nationally. We can talk a little bit more about that in the question answer session, but we're, we're curious about the effects and the multiple traumas that Sonoma County communities and students have faced and the way in which students are, are responding and experiencing feelings of depression, stress, and anxiety. 
Still, while the rest of the nation has somewhat caught up, which is a terrible thing to say, with this being the number one barrier, you'll notice that Sonoma County numbers still remain higher than the national average. Importantly, other distractions like or barriers like distractions at home and um, students' own health or the health of their friends and families are additional barriers to them. But again, the, the number one most, most um, persistent and pervasive barrier from students self-reported is feelings of depression, stress, or anxiety. Let's look at that another way. Let's look at it by uh, fire effect. So this particular slide already accounts for students who have said that they were impacted or were not impacted by the fire. And the percentage numbers that you're seeing is of those students, how many of them cited feelings of depression, stress, or anxiety? And so you'll notice that between those that were saying they were not impacted and those that were saying they were impacted by the fires, a great increase in the reported feelings of depression, stress, or anxiety. We can look at similar data in multiple demographic factors, across multiple demographic factors. Karen pointed out that one of the, the more important things we can do is, is play around in the data and disaggregate for things like gender or primary language or socioeconomic status, gender. In this case, we're calling out specifically sexual orientation because this was by far and away the largest discrepancy between the aggregate overall student response and any particular demographic filter. Another way to explain this is that middle school and high school students who are not straight, who identify other than straight, had much higher rates of depression, stress, and anxiety than their straight peers. And again, we're, we're really calling out this particular demographic group because by far and away in this category, there was the largest discrepancy for them compared to the aggregate. Something we can think about. Let's talk a little bit more about mental health and, and well being. And one of the, the tough topics, especially given that in the last um, two weeks, we've had a student death by suicide at one of our local high schools. This feels very relevant to me. Last year in both January and April, middle and high school students were asked, have you seriously considered attempting suicide? And what you're looking at is the data correlated with those that were saying that they were greatly or significantly impacted by fires. And on the right-hand side, those students who were saying they were greatly or significantly impacted by COVID. Perhaps not surprisingly, but, but surely devastatingly, those students um, that were impacted by recent community traumas have been more likely to report um, contemplations of suicide. Silver lining perhaps is that these numbers are not terrifically higher than the national average. Sonoma County numbers look a lot like youth truth numbers across the nation. And I think anyone in this group will, will know and, and attest that these numbers are still too high. Let's talk for a couple minutes before we close about some, um, some core protective factors. One of the things that we know in, from this community, our local Sonoma County community's investment in adverse childhood experiences, in trauma-informed work, and in what builds resilient communities, we know that core protective factors that offset the impact of childhood trauma involved involve in large part relationships, right? Certainly um, personal feelings of efficacy and, and control over my future, but additionally relationships. Do I have a community that I feel like I can belong to and can turn to? I pull that out because this particular data finding shows the number of students who say they do not have one caring adult at their high school, at their school rather, that they can go to when they're feeling those feelings of upset, stress, or other problems. And so over half of Sonoma County students said no 
that they disagree. They do not have that adult they can go to. Again, this is all data from as recent as last year. 61% of middle school students and 68% of high school students. So nearly, um, you know, almost two in three high school students were disagreeing, saying they do not have an adult that they can go to. In no way as an educator is this a, uh, you know, um, recall a referendum on, on the educators. As Karen said, goodness, have they shown up to, to do right by our students. And given um, the emergency response to distance learning and a little bit of the separation of our community, the kids are telling us those folks aren't accessible to them. We really hope that will change this year and that we can continue to change that since we know this actually matters in terms of both individual and community resilience. The last set of data that I'll share with you before we open it up to um, a, few more, uh, a few more things we wanna chat about together today. The topic near and dear to my heart is readiness for the future. I am super excited to, um, with the support of Community Foundation in, in particular, as well as the CTE Foundation locally, have a more robust survey going forward in terms of capturing students' perceptions of their readiness. Meaning we're actually gonna build out a better and more full survey than even the one we've experienced thus far, including student perceptions of readiness for what's next. I'm belaboring this a little bit because I think readiness starts super early. And yet we have some data that we're gonna share from last year's high school students about what they're telling us in terms of their feelings of readiness. With the caveat again that if we wait till high school, it's too late. So you're looking at data from Sonoma County High School students in orange compared to the sort of brown caramel color nationally. So across multiple questions that get at readiness for both college and career, Sonoma County students are reporting much lower levels of readiness than their peers nationally. In some cases, half as low, right? So in terms of careers, matching interests and abilities, exploring the career that I want, knowing the steps that it takes to apply to college and many other domains, students in Sonoma County feel less prepared. As a college and career readiness lead for the County Office of Education, I take that pretty seriously. And I'd love to share some things that we're hoping to do to do better by students. A couple other pieces of data I'd like to pause on before we commence to the next activity is to acknowledge that nationally one in four high school seniors post-secondary plans have changed since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. I have had the opportunity to do numerous empathy interviews, so human-centered conversations with students across Sonoma County, and over and over and over and over again, I have heard that them reinforce this data finding. Of course my plans have changed because the world is more uncertain. The things that even like my older brother and sister have been guaranteed or have been able to prepare for or think about is not a given for me anymore. And so, yes, my plans have changed and have pivoted. And so we'd expect to see that nationally, about 25%. Here's the interesting finding. In Sonoma County, that number's higher. As many as one in three Sonoma County high school seniors post-secondary plans have changed since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. You might be asking, what are they changing to? Unfortunately, that's not necessarily um, a, a data point that we uh, collected information around. Oops, I'm actually gonna stop sharing because Caitlin would like to share that next. Um, a data point that we, we collected information around, um, but we will, and we'd be more than happy to share and are excited to share what the students this year have to tell us. At this point though, I'm gonna pause and, and turn it back to Karen to say, what do we do about this? Well, thank you so much, Jessica. And I, I just, I so appreciate your depth of knowledge around this data. There's some interesting questions in the chat you might want to take a look at. Um, right. And 
now, um, as you said, I'm going to shift to, to the origins, the reason why Hewlett Foundation said, let's do this project. And that is, um, you know, how does this inform us as a community foundation that is, you know, cares so much about elevating voice and turning to those who we want to support to learn from them? Um, you know, how is this going to influence our grant making over the next uh, couple of years from the Resilience Fund? And, um, you know, as Beth mentioned at the onset, healing from the trauma is a uh, primary focus for the Resilience Fund, and that is going to guide our grant making. But how do we make a decision when there's so much to do and so much to address? So that's our job. Um, that's the job of my team, Ariana and myself. Um, we, we look at what does the data tell us? What's out there? What are best practices? Um, how can we help um, support the core protective factors? Um, so Caitlin, why don't you go ahead and share that slide? So we're still in the research phase of figuring out um, what we're going to be investing in with our grant making. Um, but we do know that there are major themes that are arising and um, you know, mental health, supporting mental health is, is primary. Uh, as the data said, there are vulnerable populations who are carrying the burden more than others. So we're looking at these three buckets, supporting students with a targeted me mental health support, and really looking at um, how we support those most impacted, like our LGBTQ youth, um, getting counselors into schools, and really looking at um, culturally meaningful, culturally relevant emotional support for our BIPOC youth. Um, the next bucket is uh, addressing that, that readiness piece, um, helping to build those core protective factors by um, developing, looking at programs that help develop leadership skills, um, great work-based learning programs here in Sonoma County, how can we elevate those? And then college and career readiness that, um, you know, great partners in the Career Technical Education Foundation and others who are, you know, preparing kids and helping them see their future, which uh, allows them to, um, you know, that really helps alleviate that anxiety and stress. And then finally, the burden that's, that, that teachers are carrying and the schools are carrying, we, we cannot express enough how much we need to be reaching out to our, our teachers. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the school board meetings right now, but parents are really, really upset and they're really taking it out on our teachers. Um, this is a difficult time. So we want to be supporting the teachers. We want to be supporting the schools. One initiative that we're so excited about that Jessica is leading is through the Sonoma County Office of Education. They're going to do a cohort model. There will be new data coming out on um, in December, January of this year, we know the data is going to shift. Things have shifted in the school, so we're going to be looking at the most current data, and they're going to build cohorts of um, school teams who are going to look at their own individual data, um, work with students to figure out what what can we do? How can we how can we do this better? And then also partner with community based organizations to help figure out the solutions. So really excited about that program. Um, we know our our teachers need to have trauma informed um, approaches as they're working with their students, and they need the support and training to get that. And then just our, our teachers need some support for their own mental health. We're not doing grant making in all of these areas. We're just sharing with you the themes that are, are coming up, that there is opportunity to be investing in all of these areas. But our job over the next couple of months is to, to target and look at where we are uniquely positioned to have the greatest impact. Um, I just, I just want to close with recognizing something that, um, you know, I've been at the Community Foundation, it'll be 10 years on October 4th, and um, I, I think the most important decision that we have made in that time was to put a stake in the ground around with the Resilience Fund to commit to the medium and long-term um, recovery of our community. Uh, this is why there are lasting and long-term impacts from disasters. And sometimes you can't address them in the, in the immediate response phase. You need to stick with it and see what the community is going to need to recover. And I am just so grateful to 
every single donor who contributed to the Resilience Fund that allows us now to step in at this critical moment. I mean, we've been doing grant making all along, but at this moment in time to be supporting our youth is, is um, it's a real honor. So- And may uh, I just uh, echo that? And I don't know if folks can see me because I may not be, thank you, Caitlin. Little off script here, and I, I do apologize for the interruption, but I, as an educator, I just want to echo that um, schools are being asked to do more and more with the same amount of resources and time. And we know we need to do better by our students, but the sort of moral imperative um, from you all as community members to take seriously you know, mental health and well-being and belonging and other aspects of what school means beyond the traditional academics feels like just what we need to keep our eye on the prize. We have a clear moral imperative, a mandate from the community that we're so grateful for and your, your willingness to show us that we're not alone in that, um, that schools don't have to, to do this alone, that there are many community organizations and folks like yourselves that are, are, are ready to help if only we make a good ask. And so I just wanted to say that from a, a gratitude perspective. Um, thank you for your accountability and support is maybe a better way to say that. And I'll, I'll endeavor to answer any questions that don't get answered in the general Q&A um, through the chat. So that okay. if you had a question, it's, it's answered. Thank you, Jessica. I really, I'm, I'm glad you, you shared that. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to our fabulous Kristen Nelson, Director of Philanthropic Advising to take us to the next phase of our uh, experience together. And I'm even going to unmute. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone. I'm so pleased to see you all here. And it's just such a pleasure to, to share this space and time with you as we think about the solutions and the ideas and the things that we can do to support Sonoma County's young people. Um, I'm really grateful for all the great questions that have popped up in the chat and some that have been sent to me directly. Um, please feel free to keep those coming while I pose your questions to Karen and Jessica right now, of course. Um, and the first thing I'd like to say is there's a couple of questions that are around the data itself and the way that the data, the questions have been asked. Um, but let's start kind of with the big picture first, which is, um, and I think Karen, you may have touched a little bit on this, but someone is curious if it's possible to actually get into the site specific data to really look at, uh, I think you said not to districts, but maybe to a school particularly, if there's a donor who's interested in supporting a very specific geographic area. Is that possible? Jessica, you take this one. I'll take that one. I'm happy to take that one. Um, of course, you know, Community Foundation, SCO, or CTE Foundation, who is, has access to site-specific the survey is at the site level, and then they're aggregated at the district level. So both are possible. Um, but any of those organizations that I just mentioned that have access to that site and district data would never, without permission, share it on those schools and, and districts behalf. And I have yet to meet a school partner who's looking for support from the community who isn't able to, and, and isn't willing rather, really is the word, to, to share that data on their own. Um, I think it's a great thing to ask. And if, if I can support you um, in making that ask or making that connection, I'd be glad to do so. I'll answer one other piece of a, of a question I saw that I think is related. Um, and that has to do with district by district comparison. The sort of, the, the same answer applies. So an individual site, can actually filter their data. And instead of seeing that California data that I referenced, they can compare themselves to just Sonoma County or to just rural schools or to just schools with high populations of English learners, right? So again, they can do that and you can ask them to share that data where they stand with respect to the county. But so that we're supportive of sort of all districts getting better um, versus, you know, kind of pitting them against each other and, and, and having it be a competition, we won't share that data on their behalf. Thank you. There's another question about the structure of some of the questions themselves. Um, and I think drilling down specifically to the question of students feeling like they had someone to talk to at their school. Can you tell me if the language of the question 
was specific to the school site itself, or was it that there were other nonprofits or organizations that might be able to step in and fill that role, like the Boys and Girls Club or Mentoring Alliance? Karen, do you want me to take that one as well? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I figured I, I obsessively know the instrument a little too do. well um, <laughs> as we've been going through the inventory of questions. The, the answer is both. Um, so the, the exact language, there are actually two questions about a caring adult. The first one that all students receive is something along the lines of, is there a caring adult in your life, in your life, that you can turn to when you're feeling upset or having problems? There is a second question that specifies, is there a caring adult at your school? And so we have data around both. You'll notice today we specifically shared around the school, um, but that is a question that um, we could absolutely share data around if you wanted to know more broadly um, what are students saying in terms of an adult in their lives. Thank you. Um, now, do, you, do any of the schools in the survey itself have mentoring programs? Do we know that? And if we do, if, there, if they do exist, is there data specifically that supports the impact of having those programs compared to not having them? Great question. And Karen, tell me to, to shut up when, uh, when you want to interject I will here, jump but I'll in. see what then. <laughs> but these are your questions. Yeah, they're definitely school questions. I think this is my domain, but let me know if I'm talking too much. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, there, yes and no. So a two-part question. The first, the first part is absolutely. We, we know of schools that have mentoring programs, and that's um, sort of a a qualitative and locally sourced list that we keep at SCO that we'd be happy to share with you. What we can't do yet is, is measure their effectiveness uh, within the Youth Truth Survey. However, Karen mentioned this cohort, this group of schools and districts wishing to take action around their data, right? It's not enough to ask students how they're doing. I think there's a little bit of a responsibility or a great responsibility to involving them and, and following up and making it right and improving it. And so part of that cohort will be to look at the data, to get curious about that data, to investigate things like what you're asking. Oh, do we have a mentoring program? To sort of mark that and to then look at change over time. So even a school who doesn't have an, a mentoring program through this cohort might choose to implement one and will be able to have longitudinal data, data, data over time, over the next several years that will be able to help them understand, hmm, has this had an impact for students or not? That's great. Karen, is there anything else that you'd like to add on that? You had a look. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. I was well, just enjoying Jessica's answer. <laughs> So this is actually a question that I, I'm, I'm aggregating a little bit based on a couple of different things that have come forward, which is really what are nonprofits and what else is SCO? And I think you've just talked a little bit about the cohort, but are there other things that either the nonprofit community themselves and SCO are doing in response to this data? I mean, I can add something there just to, as an example. Um, in, in April of this year, we did host, um, we, we called them town halls, we, we gathered community-based organizations and others uh, to first take a look at the data, and then at the second gathering, um, we said, what are we going to do about it? And um, we've seen community members and uh, primarily nonprofits saying, okay, it's our responsibility, and even just Last week, um, I was on a panel with the Latino service providers. They have youth promotores, uh, young people who are actively engaging in leadership and learning. Um, and they had me present the data um, at, a, at a webinar that was called Path to Hope. And they had six young people uh, on their panel talking about their struggles with their own mental health. and. Um, talking with a counselor about what they can do, uh, what they're encouraging other people to do to address their struggles. And so I think what, what, what we're seeing nonprofits do is take the data, elevate it, share it with everyone, and then help build programming um, that can address those, uh, what, what we're learning. So um, a lot of activation around the data. I would add, um... 
and amplify everything that Karen just said to, to offer that as part of that cohort effort. So again, um, we have, thanks to Community Foundation, folks like yourselves, the CTE Foundation, now a consistent survey instrument for all of Sonoma County moving forward. So I, I won't go into the details, but we've had different schools survey each year, as Karen pointed out, with slightly different questions at different times of the year. And we're really cleaning up our act there. Um, again, for this better, more reliable longitudinal data, we're committing to a consistent cohort of nearly 100 schools. Uh, over three years serving at the same time with the exact same questions. And from that, sites and districts will get their results back in early 2022, as Karen mentioned, and be supported in taking action around them. So literally setting an aim, some um, quality improvement, improvement science work, for whom and how much and by when do we want to make an improvement in what particular area. And where we're definitely going to need community support is what we do about it in response. What do we try as we endeavor to, to attain those aims, both in terms of schools needing support to, to, to fund and try things, as well as community partners, like you mentioned, mentorship programs and others that are a great fit to some of the things that we see emerging in the data. And I, I just want to take a little moment to say the Hewlett foundation support of this work has ended. So they launched the Bay Area Initiative, um, but it has ended. And this is the great philanthropic story around, you know, a, a, a foundation seeding something and then a community coming in and embracing it. And big, big thanks to Sonoma County Office of Education for saying, okay, this is so important that we're going to fund the survey for the next three years. And so it started with philanthropy, it took hold, and SCO is now embracing it. So thank you so much. Here. Um, to follow up on some of those data questions around the survey specifically, um, someone has asked that you've sur surveyed or pointed out you surveyed about 25,000 students. What's the percentage of total Sonoma County students in this? And are there any issues with the sample that you're still working on? So I think some of it was the timing, right? But there, are there any other issues that the, the new sample that's coming in? Um, and are there big discrepancies from district to district that we should be aware of? Great questions. And please, uh, Kristen, help me if I don't address all three parts of that good question. I can take a few of those. And, and of course, Karen, as always, please chime in as things strike you. Um, the first piece about um, the number of students who were surveyed compared to the total number of students, I need to pull up my SCO ed facts. My superintendent would not be very proud of me, but we're just around just under 40,000 students in Sonoma County. And we heard from um, nearly 25,000 of them last school year. Um, a couple things I want to point out related to that. The first is uh, that the, the number of students in Sonoma County is K-12, whereas the student survey for youth truth is third through 12th grade. So already um, we're, we're eliminating kindergarten first and second graders, students, just because they're simply not quite ready to read yet. That doesn't mean we're not collecting information from that important demographic. Their staff and families that serve those grade level students also responded to the survey and we heard from them. The second thing is around response rate. Youth Truth is uh, rigorous in ensuring a very strong response rate. In fact, certain schools who don't re meet the necessary response rate, they look for at least a 70% response rate, um, don't receive all of the levels of reports. Um, that ensures data reliability, that ensures anonymity, the ability to disaggregate, all of those important things that we know are necessary with data. So maybe a more simple and, and, and quick uh, answer to that first part of the question, Kristen, is um, it was a really strong showing. It's reliable data from Sonoma County. And as you mentioned, we want to clean up our act even further going forward. Um, common survey instruments, same cohort of schools, same questions uh, across the same time of year. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> yeah, of course, you nailed it. So good job. <laughs> um, is there any information regarding coping skills or substance abuse that's popped up from the survey? I'll, I'll keep going. Um, I can, I think if I understand that question, and please, I think it's Sylvia, please correct me if I'm 
um, I'm interpreting this wrong, but the, the first thing I can say is that within the actual survey instrument itself, when students in particular are answering some of the more um, serious and grave responses around su suicidal ideation, around mental health, within the survey itself, there are resources that they're pointed to. So that, you know, it's totally anonymous. We don't know who's saying what. And every student is offered, okay, if you're saying yes, these are some, some hotlines you might want to call, some warm lines, these are some supports. I think also what you're asking is, what about the follow-up? Um, Youth Truth has a tremendous amount of resources. Part of being this amazing national network is that we have access to all of the best practices from schools across the country who are, who are struggling with some of the similar things. And so in this sort of backpack that they call it of tools that are available to educators, um, there are many of the resources that you're, you're talking about. Um, and not to plug the cohort again, but we know you all have, have wisdom and work with, with organizations that um, definitely have expertise in certain areas. And so we would welcome that um, to this cohort effort, some local expertise. Do you know if there is data that talks about how or if young people are utilizing and what kinds of coping skills they're utilizing or if they're you know, if we're seeing trends related to substance abuse, is that showing up here or is that because it's self-reported data? Yeah, Karen, Karen and I can talk a lot about that and some of the behind the scenes conversations we've had there. The, the short answer is that yes, Youth Truth has a TUPE, Tobacco Use and um, Prevention Module. So I talked about those domains. Mm -hmm. um, that exists. And we have some data, um, both really more California and nationally. Locally, um, we have you know, other data sources like California Healthy Kids and things that su support information related to substance abuse. Here's, here's the, the thing that I'll say that's a little bit of an editorialization about that. Uh, so forgive me. The Youth Truth Instrument is so powerful, as you mentioned, Kristen, because it's student self-reported. It's very pro-student. It takes seriously that their perceptions are research-based tied to their academic outcomes and life chances. And so we want to make sure as we include more about substance abuse and things like that, that it's really still pro-student and not a gotcha, where they're not feeling like they can trust the rest of the survey. So I know that's a little bit of a, an incomplete answer, but it's, I think, the true one. I think that's great. I see that we're getting close to needing to wind down. Um, I've got a couple of more questions. So there might be some things that we respond to afterwards um, and we can do some outreach specifically to get back to anyone that we've missed one. But I did wanna ask one more question. We've talked about the survey being really this, what makes it so powerful is that we're collecting information about students in that youth focused voice, but we're also looking at how we can corroborate the data from teachers and staff within the schools and parents. Um, do you have any takeaways? And I think this is really to both of you, um, but really specific takeaways that you have about that data that's looking at these this wider population right here that you'd like to share, since we didn't have time to talk about it today. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in really quickly because I'm uh, cognizant of the time. I, one of the things that really stood out for me um, was some data that we're hearing from families and students and teachers around concerns around housing and concerns around affordable housing and concerns around being able to stay in this community because of the lack of affordable housing and um, the toll that that's taking on um, sense of well-being and, and, um, and understanding of the future. So I think um, that, that was just one of the things that struck me to see a middle school student saying they're concerned about housing was a, a real surprise. Yeah, that's, that's pretty powerful. Jessica, would you, do you have something else that's written for you? I guess for me, um, like a sort of high level response is that we might expect to see educators, staff and, and families somewhat contradict what their students are saying. Um, I've had a lot of conversations about that. Like, are student perceptions really reliable? Well, we got to take them seriously regardless, because as I mentioned, research has proven that regardless of reality, perceptions impact academic outcomes and life chances. And in Sonoma County, we heard 
much of the same data that I shared with you about students reflected from families and staff. So I think for me, um, it was affirming, though a little, a little distressing, to hear that both families and staff, you know, sort of agreed and corroborated with what we saw in the student data. Yeah. Well, on that, um, thank you both so much for taking the time to answer questions. I'm going to hand things back over to Beth, um, but I just am really grateful to you both for for just being so transparent, asking so many great, you know, the donors and everyone who's on this call for asking so many great questions. I think it's a, a wonderful way for us to move the conversation forward. So, yeah. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Karen. And especially a big thank you to Jessica. So as I do a little time travel backwards uh, in my mind's eye to almost four years ago, when um, several of us were, were in, the, in the conference room at the Community Foundation and what we decided to take a stand on is what community foundations take a stand on, which is for the long view of the health of the community and the resilience of the community. We could have never imagined that some of the funds and what resilience would have looked like would have, in would have included the impact of a pandemic four years out. Some of you gave to the Resilience Fund on the first day we launched it. And I wanna thank you so much for the faith that you put in us. And I hope we've done you proud and that our approach and that we are still in the investment business of resilience for Sonoma County and we will be for the long haul. Um, and we invite your continued co-investment uh, with us. So in whatever way that looks like to you, um, philanthropy at its best is a combination of head and heart. Data is usually in the heady part of this equation, um, but this, this has been a conversation full of heart. And I wonder what, for all of you, what your heart will move you to do next. I hope at the very least, in the very short order, like today, it uh, causes you to thank a teacher or to hug a student or to do something really direct, knowing the struggles that are going on right now. And I also hope it influences your giving. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, comment in the chat and the discussion about mentoring and the importance of one caring adult. So maybe you'll think about the giving of your time a little bit differently the rest of this year and the giving of your philanthropic investment. And we'd love to talk to you uh, about that, either related to the Resilience Fund or specific nonprofit organizations, or just to stay in this conversation um, uh, with one another. So I thank you so much. If you have time on your way out of the Zoom room, I'd love you to pop into the chat and just say maybe just one word describing um, uh, what you're taking away from this time together uh, today. So thank you everyone and look forward to seeing you uh, for real in person before long. Thank you.